James. Um, and Steve's going to talk on topics about particularly collimation for people who have reflectors that need to do that and are confused by what to do and cleaning um, of optics and um, we're looking also going to be looking at accessories so I'll quickly, this will be very familiar to um, many of you, is it? You know. Keep it interactive, so if you've got some questions, don't save them to the end, um, let us know. Oh, I'll try and answer the question. Okay. So, um, just a quick introduction. The basic um, telescope, as you know, is a refractor, the first one invented. We've got one up in the corner there, isn't it? Nice example of a not very portable, a six inch refractor. So, you can see why um, um, refractors traditionally have a long tube like that, and it shows the reason here. Because if you had a simple lens or even a more advanced type of lens I'm going to talk about, to stop this problem you can see that the different colours are refracted to different degrees. So you, with a simple lens like that you can't get all the colours to the same focal point at once. So you can get red in focus and the other colours are out, out of focus. Basically the objective lens is acting like a prism. So the different colours get refracted in a slightly different amount. So the first way um, to cure this, you can use a, a chromatic lens, which goes back quite a long time in history. The first um, person credited with this idea goes to um, Chester Moore Hall back in 1733. came up with the idea of using two different kinds of glass it had different dispersion properties, which is the difference between the refraction of the different colours. And he um, and also um, John Bolland independently worked out the same thing, that by combining the two glasses with a positive lens and a negative lens not quite as strong, if you like. So um, you can bring two colours to the same focus in one colour, but maybe you have the the violet out of focus or the green out of focus depending on how you design and so you probably you may have seen things like binoculars where you get or a simple refractor where you get this what they call colour fringing especially on a bright object like the moon will have a, a purple uh, halo around it and it's because the um, the refractive optics um, can't bring the colours to the exact same focal point You'll often see it on cameras as well, so if you were to take a picture of the moon, you'll often see that you've got kind of a green fringe on one side and a purple fringe on the other. Yeah, yeah, that's a type of chromatic, it's called chromatic aberration. Um, camera lenses can fix that, but you start to pay a lot more money. <laughs> and um, similarly for telescopes, so you can go to this kind of lens, which is called an apochromatic lens. They will usually have one really expensive glass element of a um, type of glass they call ED or extra low dispersion, really a marketing term. Uh, different companies have different uh, glasses like this. Sometimes they will use a um, fairly exotic material, calcium fluoride. Uh, the problem with that is it's very soft, so you can't use it as the, the element at the front of the lens because you could damage it too easily. So if they use calcium fluoride, it would be one of the two um, internal lenses, depending on the design. And these lenses are pretty expensive, but not as much as they used to be, say, 20 years ago. Um, so there's more mass production involved with them now. So we can avoid that problem by using this type of telescope invented by Sir Isaac Newton. So there's no refractive elements, so it's just done with mirrors. You have a, a flat secondary mirror there, near the front of the tube, and this is an example here, it's the shown. And at the back you have a primary mirror, which is um, normally of a parabolic shape, and that brings the light to focus by reflecting off the secondary mirror and being transferred out to the focuser at the side, which you can See here. So, I'm sure you all know this one. You may not all know so There's a flat mirror in the side there. So, there's several um, reasons these are a lot cheaper. You've got only a flat mirror, 
and a fairly simple curve on one side of a primary mirror, whereas your, your triplet refractor, you've got six surfaces that have to be really accurately um, configured and polished. And exotic glass types, as I mentioned. Many, so, of, the, many of the lower cost um, telescopes that a lot of people start off with um, that are typically kind of these sort of uh, usually sort of four to five inches, um, sometimes with little short tubes. They make them cheaper uh, by using a spherical mirror surface because a spherical mirror is really easy to grind. Um, and they often use, particularly with the short tube ones, they use uh, essentially a magnifying lens that's sort of like a Barlow and a Bird Jones design. And the reason they do that is it sort of kind of corrects the aberrations you get from the spherical mirror. Slightly bigger telescopes, slightly more expensive telescopes, the Newtonian design will have a parabolic mirror surface, which is much better at bringing those parallel light rays to a proper focus. But it still has some optical, in fact, all telescope designs have got some compromises, uh, some sorts of aberrations that you've got to be aware of. With a Newtonian design, with a parabolic mirror, it's coma, so the stars around the edges of your field seem to sort of swoosh off to the side. Yeah, so. out a little bit. So um, this, um, I'm pretty sure all of the Astron's Newtonians are all got parabolic yeah, mirrors. we don't have any spherical mirrors. <laughs> okay, so um, um, one thing, we might as well do it now, because one issue you have with this kind of telescope is that you can see that the alignment of these mirrors is fairly critical. So if um, that mirror isn't nice and square to the tube, then yeah, the reflection might even miss the secondary if it's really bad. Um, and the secondary's got to be positioned in the right place at the right angle to um, centre the um, focus image in the middle of the focus line. And um, Steve, do you want to um, explain how that's done? Yeah, I'll go and get mine. Um, people are a bit scared of this, but it's actually not really that difficult. Um, when Steve's ready, I'll, I'll just show you the you make the adjustments to the main mirror with these screws. There's three locking screws and three adjustment screws. So if you want to make the adjustment, you get these off the locking screws, make your adjustments and then do them back up again. At this end, I'll let Steve take over to show you how this yes. is done. So as most of you know, or many of you know, the process is called combination and all uh, Reflecting telescope. In fact, all telescopes, to some extent, require some combination, which is aligning the optics. There's various ways of actually doing that. Um, the simplest and quickest way on a Newtonian, which isn't the best way, it's, it's just the simplest and quickest way, is to use a laser like this. Um, what this does is shines a laser beam in, into the eyepiece hole, which it will reflect off the secondary mirror. Uh, it'll then hit the primary mirror, so you'll see a laser dot in the middle of the primary mirror. Now the primary mirror on most telescopes um, of this type has got a mark in the center, a, a circle or a dock. Um, then that light, the light should reflect all the way back and hit pretty much exactly the same spot in the secondary and then come directly into the same hole on the laser. So the laser has got a screen so you can see. I don't know how well collimated this one is. So, uh, I just did it about an, an hour and a half ago. Okay, so we'll, we'll see, see how well you we'll did see that. how good Aaron did, or <laughs> consequently how, how, how off my uh, laser collimator is. Otherwise it failed. Now, the, the, the reason why this isn't very accurate is because, I don't know if you can see in the little screen there, you can see the dots. Now that dot isn't quite in the center. It's not quite in the center. And the reason is, Actually, there's quite a lot of slop in all of this system. You see, I just wiggle this, it's going to move along a little bit. But this is why it's not massively the most accurate way of doing it, but it is quick. So, um, it is convenient. So, the adjustments that you can do, uh, you can adjust the secondary. Adjusting the secondary, actually, secondary is slightly. Do the um, uh, colour around the back. I was just checking my collimators are okay, <laughs> but the collimator is not too bad. So if you look on the inside, you look at the main mirror, you can see that. Uh, you can see, yeah, about four or five. Um, so you can, can you see the dot on the on the primary mirror there. So there's a there's a dot in the centre of that, and the aim of the exercise, the first part of that is. I should have prepared one earlier. 
screwdriver. Well, step one is never drop a screwdriver into the telescope. So surprisingly easily done. You're out in the field, out in the dark, out in your backyard, and you're going, whoops. <laughs> Doesn't do your mirror in any good whatsoever. So an adjustment of the secondary will move that laser around. So I'm just going to stuff up there and tell that you can fix it later. And you see I'm adjusting that. You can see the laser moving around. You can also see the laser moving around up here. So um, the reflection is moving around. So the end of the exercise is make small adjustments. Don't drop your screwdriver. And the way that this, it's actually important to realize the three screws that, the way that that works is that's a, a plate with three screws on the outside and one screw holding it in the middle. So if you loosen one of these screws, this plate can pivot. But if you loosen one, then this plate is loose. So I've um, had people come to me, I have members come to me with, oh, my telescope is collimated, it's not collimated anymore. And that's because if you loosen two of the screws, so you're sort of moving it down that way, and don't tighten the third one, it's not going to be rigid. So you've got to make sure that you, any adjustment you do on one screw, you have about half that adjustment to do on the other screws. So Just be careful you don't over tighten though, because that can cause problems as well. Yeah, you can actually um, tweak the mirror surface, you can actually bend the mirror. So that's roughly on, I'm not going to much time, you see it's roughly going back to the, to the spot there. But if it wasn't, then the other, the other thing is adjust is the primary mirror. So if I can, I should see that moving around now. So it actually takes less than five minutes to collimate the Newtonian. So if you've got a Newtonian and anybody's scared you by saying, oh, if you don't, don't touch those screws, it's, uh, just put up with it, it's too scary to collimate, it's not as easy. So you said that the, the main mirror doesn't, you want to first deal with your second mirror. On a Newtonian, yes, it does. Yeah. So you're trying to get that, um, so you've got the laser coming in here, yeah. and the laser's going to hit the, yeah. the primary here. So there's only one thing to adjust here. So there's only one thing that you can adjust that will adjust where that laser hits on this primary mirror. So that's what you do. Once that's dead on, and the more accurate you are with that step, actually the, the adjustment of the secondary is so much more important because you're magnifying any, any issues you've got with your secondary as soon as you've reflected it back on. So the primary mirror adjustments are primarily just to keep it steady and level. Well, the, the, both of them are to keep the... Yeah. So the light goes the opposite way to the laser, of course. So yeah. the light comes in here, it comes in in parallel rays. Yeah. Then the parabolic surface is going to focus that down to a point that would be here if the secondary mirror wasn't in the way. Um, and you want that to be just straight down the middle of the tube. So when you put it through the secondary, it goes straight up. If you don't, then what you've got is, a, is an image that's skewed, it's twisted slightly. Uh, it's either got astigmatism or it's just not it's just not straight. So you're not going to get a good image. The effects of that when you're looking through it is that stars will appear to kind of um, flare out on one side, they'll appear to not come down to pinpoints, you'll try and focus it and it won't focus to a dot, it'll focus to an oblique blob. If you're looking at the moon or you're looking at planets, it'll just be fuzzy. You'll think, oh I can't just get a sharp image out of it. Plenty of people have got rid of the telescopes because all it needed was five minutes worth of adjustment. Okay, so step one would be to get the laser in the dot in the back. Yes. And step two would get the, get the laser, laser back into the back into, into the dot that it came out. Top, yeah. 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 So there's actually, I'll just interrupt here because there's a step zero. One of our members had this problem where you notice yes. the laser goes into an adapter because this telescope has a two inch diameter focuser. So the laser is a one and a quarter inch diameter barrel. So you need one of these, which if I can loosen off a bit. So that, that basically allows you to put, use a one and a quarter inch eyepiece and a two inch focuser. Uh, there are different sorts of these, so that, that one is fine. See how the tightening screw is on the ridge? But you get this type, which usually comes with Barlow lens, and you notice where the, the tightening screw 
And on the bar, it has a slot that, that drops down into it. There's no slot here. So you always end up with a lot of slot. And um, one of our members was saying, well, you can even get his, he tries to collimate with the laser. But it's never working. He just makes things worse. So we said, I'll oh, bring it in and we'll have a look. And that was the problem. He was using the wrong kind of adapter. So yeah, that's just a gotcha to be aware of. Most of the colors come with the two inch gap now, anyway. Oh, do they? Okay. Uh, what happens if you've got a uh, older card strap without the top? So uh, that does happen, and um, what I do um, is put a dot on the mirror. Now it is true that the center, the geometric center of the mirror, you can work out where that is, isn't necessarily the optical center, because if you can imagine. Uh, it's possible to have a lens with a, that's a circle and then cut out a circle that was you know, a quarter of a centimetre to the left and then the centre of that mirror is at the centre of it. But generally, because of mass production, they're pretty good. What I would normally do, um, and this may not be, well, this is probably the easiest way that I've found, is I actually print out on a sheet of clear film, uh, what used to be used for overhead projectors, um, a circle of the right diameter and a crosshair in the middle, which I make a hole in there. I put that over the mirror so I can see it and then put a dot through the middle of the hole and then so I dot the centre of the mirror with a fine marker. Um, after you've done that, you've got a couple of options. One of the common um, ways of doing it, because it's important to realise you, you worry about, this, oh, I don't want to touch the very centre of my mirror, it's going to be a big problem. Well, actually, you've got a 30 second recovering up the centre of your mirror anyway, so don't worry about that. Yeah, so the centre of your mirror is in the shadow yeah. of the secondary so The centre of your mirror never actually cool. gets any light, you're not collecting <laughs> anything. So never worry if you've got a mark or something in the middle of that. Um, ring binder uh, reinforcements is a good one to put there, because you've got a circle in the middle, put that straight in the middle, so the old, good old A4 ring binder reinforcements. Or just a dot. So, Make a dot is, is the way to do that, and I've done that on, on a, a number of uh, a number of telescopes. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that's the yeah. quick way, but not the best. What's the best? The best with all of these is to go out under the stars, uh, and I'll talk about a technique when we get to the cool. others. You, you start test the telescope yeah. basically. So you can make fine adjustments. So this is going to get you a coarse collimation. Then under the stars, there's a couple of things that you're looking for. I'll talk about it when we get to the Cassegrain, because that's the best way I've found to do the Cassegrain. Right. Um, does, oh, more questions does, before does we move on? Does society have a collimator that he was going to use? Um, we've probably not got one that you can take away, but you can absolutely bring the scopes in and get myself or Darren to have a look. That's, um, yeah. Or if you do want to buy one, Andrew does have them for sale. Um, if you've got a Newtonian scope, it is worth owning one because, particularly if you take it anywhere, the biggest thing that knocks a scope like that out of collimation is throwing it in your car and getting it out. So if I take an 8 inch dob anywhere, actually the first thing I do after I get out of the car is fire the laser in, click back, yeah, we're good, we haven't moved it much in transit, and then you've just got a better imaging session. Especially, oh, especially with big, um, especially the third bit of the laser, just the little bit of the yeah, well, and it's the primaries that normally go out of collimation first, just because there's more mass there on, on these. Yeah. Got a question about the mirrors. Sorry? They, the mirrors, are they front silvered? Yes. yes. Both mirrors front silvered? Yes. Yeah. In astronomy, you, uh, the mirrors are always what are called the first surface mirror. So the reflective coating is on the front surface, not yeah. like a bathroom mirror where it's silvered on the back. Yes, it's actually really important. Um, so as uh, Bill was talking about with a refractor, um, where the light passes through glass, it, it refracts, it changes um, directions, different wavelengths change at different, to different angles, and you also lose some of that light. So even you know, really good transmissive glass, there's only 97% of the light comes through. So if you had um, a mirror in your telescope that's like a mirror in your bathroom, which is a piece of glass, and you put a layer of aluminium on the back to make it shiny and to protect it, having the glass on front, what you'll see is a couple of things. One, the light that's reflected won't be quite enough. Two, there'll be a slight reflection from the front surface of the mirror, which the front surface of the glass will give you two images. And three, you may have some chromatic aberration. So what happens is that silvering that normally goes on the back of the mirror in a telescope, in all reflecting telescopes, 
it goes on the front of the mirror. So it's just the, the reflective surface. Now they may have some kind of coating. Most modern telescopes actually have got uh, a very, very thin microns level thick coating of something like silicon dioxide to make the mirror more durable. Um, but the, it's the front of the glass, it's not behind the glass. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next topic here, which is um, the Cassegrain reflector. So um, we've got um, one example of that. Where it was right, it's right next to you. Oh, yeah. yeah, so, um, and also, if you've seen the big Zeiss telescope upstairs, it's the same design. So um, this um, shows how they work on the picture up here. You've got a... You've got it here. Oh, he's uh, got it on remote control for us. Yeah, well, I want to tilt it down, and do I don't want to do dances. First, uh, I'll hang on. Stop. <laughs> Let's go manual. Let's go all manual on it. So the optics of this are a little bit different. The shape of both the uh, primary and secondary. Um, you have a, well, like in the Newtonian, the primary mirror is parabolic, and the classical Cassegrain. But the secondary mirror is a hyperbolic shape. Um, so this is a little bit trickier to make um, than a flat like you have in a Newtonian. And the secondary mirror acts, um, unlike a flat, it acts as a magnifier, so it's got a, a, a convex curve on it. Otherwise, if you didn't have that, a flat mirror would bring the focus somewhere inside the tube. So this acts as a magnifier to extend the focal point, you have a hole in the main mirror because obviously that's in the shadow of the secondary so it doesn't matter if you cut that out, you can't see the spotless for that reason because there's a big hole in the middle of it. And um, if you were trying to work out the focal length of one of these you can't simply measure the distance from here to here back to here. What you would have to do is extend this line out until it reaches the diameter of the primary. So they call that effective focal length, and it will be a lot longer than the straight um, measurement that you would do, just going from here to here, that to here. What's the focal length of that? So it's, 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 it's twice the Dobsonian. So the Dobsonian is 6, it's 1200 mil, um, and the Kessegrain is 300 mil focal length. So you can see that the focal length of this one two and nearly 2.5 two metres, but if you doubled that, you'd still be well short of that, and that's because of the magnification factor of the secondary mirror. So um, these are a little different to collimate because there's no centre spot, so Steve is going to tell us how this is done. That's right. So, so actually, these that more people have been used, have, you will have used actually are easier to collimate. We'll get to those. That's I've got that on the list of the scope. So classic cast array, <laughs> um, there's a couple of ways of doing it now. Um, the way that I collimated the Zeiss telescope um, initially it uses, a, uses a tool, uses an instrument, um, and it uses this, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit more with later, which is called a collimation telescope, a company called Takahashi makes it. Um, for these ones, there's, um, it's a little tricky to use this collimating scope on these, um, just because of uh, how they're constructed. And really it's because um, of the size of the baffle that's around this mirror here, and the size of the baffle that's at the back. You can't see the things you need to see with this scope on there. For these, the best way I've found to collimate them, uh, and actually the fastest way, is also the best way, which is actually out of the stars. Now you can use an artificial star, but the problem with that is you've got to be uh, 10 to 15 times the focal length away from the telescope for your um, artificial star, ideally 20 times, 10 to 15 is absolute minimum. Um, because otherwise you don't get a pinpoint image that you can collimate with. That's quite kind of tricky in most houses. If you're going to do it outside anyway, you may as well do it under the stars, although you've got to have good scene. So um, the way that I do these is under the stars, and it's, um, it's a going back and forward between the primary and the secondary. So, um, so the way that I will normally do it is have a look through the telescope with a sort of medium to high power eyepiece on or a camera, if I typically use a camera so that I can see what I'm doing on a screen. Um, and adjust the secondary first just to get a really, to take it out of focus slightly 
have a look at what the image looks like and you'll see a donut, so you'll see the reflection of the, the shadow of the secondary and you'll see a, a, a circle around it. So it's starting to get, so a sort of first rough adjustment is to make sure that looks concentric. Um, most people, the biggest mistake that most people make is take it too far out of focus because it just looks like a centered circle anyway if you take it too far out of focus. So just slightly out of focus. Then go on to looking at the primary merit, which is again just slightly out of focus, slightly more focused actually for the primary, and look at is there any coma? So is there any sort of uh, flaring off to one side? This is all stars in the centre, because all Cassegrains again have got aberrations around the outside. So we're going to star on centre called on axis. Um, adjust the primary to remove any coma. Go back to the secondary and have a look how far, how concentric does that look? Um, and adjust that again to get everything concentric. It should be the dot, it should be this dark circle in the middle, should be right in the middle of the, of the bigger circle. Go back into the primary, looking at the primary again. The circle that you see when you're just out of focus, is any of it brighter than any other bit? So if, the, if you've got, you can see a bit of a circle, if that bit's brighter, we need to adjust the primary to get that looking like it's evenly illuminated all the way around. Go back to the secondary again, have a look, does it work? Now at that point you probably can see there's a little dot or a poisson spot that you can see right in the center um, if you're really quite close to combination. Now you can adjust that, get everything centered up so that looks really in the center of the circle. Again, you're quite magnified on this. So you're only just out of focus. At that point you should be pretty well collimated. Most guides will then say look at an in-focus star and have a look at the airy disk around the outside of it, the ring that you can see around a perfectly focused star. You just about never get the scene good enough. So yeah, this is actually where an artificial star can Yeah, an artificial it. star you can. But no. on a real star, I mean, I don't know, have you ever actually managed to see the airy disk around a real star? No, there's usually too much. You need a high magnification and there's usually too much turbulence. Too much turbulence. So you're, so you're, sorry, how are you what is the evidence that you're slightly out of combination? So the evidence, the, the easiest thing is take it, well, if you're a lot out of collimation, you'll see your yeah. in-focus images are yeah. flaring off to one side. If you're pretty collimated, so when you're in focus, you're seeing dots, you're seeing pinpricks, yeah. then you take it slightly out of focus. Now, I always do out of outside focus, so I always take the focus at out. Um, so when you look at that, you'll see, you start to see a circle, you'll start to see a ring, you'll start to see in fact, multiple concentric rings, yeah. a diffraction pattern, um, you'll see that the illumination of that is not bright, is brighter in one area. That's the biggest thing. Or you'll see, and or you'll see, that the circle that's in the middle of that is off to one side. The circle being off to one side, typically look at the secondary, the illumination being not white or the being coma, the primary. So as you get those sort of things, they all start to look concentric. And that works with just about any telescope, actually. If it's off and you see it not evenly illuminated, your collimation's off do something about it. So it's really the same sort of process. With these, I've found it's actually just faster to do that than it is to mess about with any other instruments. Now, there are other ways of doing it. You can buy really expensive laser setups, which uh, have got multiple lasers and targets that you set up. Really complicated. I don't know anybody who's bought one of those who can actually use it. Um, you can use, there are lasers which project circles. Uh, we've got one of those, astronomers has got one of those. Um, guy who's unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago called Howie Collector. He made these really, really accurate uh, laser collimators. Uh, and he made one with um, essentially an etched blast disc which projects concentric circles. Now when you put that into one of these scopes, what you get is it projects these circles against the secondary, it projects them back onto the primary, and then it projects them out onto a wall. And what you can see is the reflection of the, the center of the center of the, the, um, the secondary, the back of the secondary, you can see the outside of the telescope. If your telescope's mechanically well aligned, then aligning up those circles will help. If it's not, and there's nothing in your optical quality that says it has to be, those mirrors are slightly off, the fact that the tube isn't down the same axis doesn't make any difference. So you can have variable effects with that. So I've seen telescopes which are perfectly collimated or as good as they're going to get, and you put in the Howie Glider laser with the circle projection and it looks like it's well off. And these are things if you read, particularly these things, Ritchie Crashens, which we'll talk about in a, in, a, in a short while. You're online if you own a Ritchie Crashen, and you look online, everybody's got their own way of doing it. And everybody says, this works best, this works best, oh, that didn't work for me. Oh, I tried that with this method, and then I tried this method, and they're supposed to be the same, and they're not. So, it's a, it can be a tricky subject.
But don't worry about it with these. With those ones, you'll learn how to start combat. That's, that's the best way of doing it. And these ones are easy. I'll just say about these. These are really good for planetary photography because you get quite a long focal length in a, in a mm. fairly compact tube. And you've got one, Steve, have you? I've got the RC. Oh, you've got the RC. But, yeah, I've seen some quite good um, planetary images taken off the, yeah. this type. Great for visual because they've got a small central obstruction because of the, the, the mirrors. You'll see when we talk about the RC, the central obstruction where the mirrors is really big. It's a proportion of the diameter of, of the aperture. They're really small, so you're getting more light with the size of the telescope. They've got a long focal length, they're easy to use. Once you understand how to comment and get your head into that, again, it's still the same. There's three screws on the front, there's three screws, six screws on the back, three lock screws and three adjustment screws. Not hard to do. I'd be happy to show everybody through it next time we clean up. The one thing you notice here is that the eyepiece is straight down the barrel. Normally, you'd have a configuration like that for astrophotography rather than visual use. Typically, visually, you'd want to put a diagonal yeah, that actually that wouldn't here. work. It wouldn't work like that because the actual focal point is about here. You can't use a diagonal? Or you need no, you can use a diagonal. Yeah. If you want to have it straight in, you need your eyepiece about here. Right, okay. So you have to have diagonal for visual too. Yeah, because otherwise it's... Um, otherwise you're sitting yeah. on the floor with a big long tube hanging out the back. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. <laughs> And, and they, in some ways they designed it delivery like that so that if you are moving, you've got, you've got room to put your camera in there to change it. The diagonal is just a flat mirror basically <laughs> that basically bends the light through an angle so it's a more, a more comfortable viewing position. The, the secret was like, if you put the eyepiece in, balance the telescope. <laughs> yeah. So you can balance it, you know, just put the eyepiece, like, right eyepiece in the balance. So that's a diagonal, so one and a quarter inch one, you'll see um, bigger ones as well. And you can see it's just got another mirror, mirror in, the, in the middle, just a uh, first surface mirror, or potentially some of them could have prisms in, but usually it's just a first surface mirror. Yeah. Yeah, there are ones out there that have dirty prisms in, so it's the right way. Uh, but no, those don't work with new targets. Mm -hmm. So the, the diagonal side of Okay, so um, this one, um, I didn't actually have a ray diagram for this, but this is a picture of a, a Richie creation of a truss arrangement. The main difference between the two scopes is that on these, both mirrors are hyperbolic, so they're quite difficult to figure. There's a critical mirror separation that you, that's the first thing that has to be correct, is these are a little bit forgiving to the separation between the mirrors. The RC, the mirror separation is quite critical. It still um, matters on those, probably yeah, you, yeah, it's a you bit might get a, giving, yeah. Yeah, you might get a, I don't know, 8 or 10 mil before you start seeing anything bad. With these really, 1 or 2 mil out when you're starting to see de degradation in the image. So that's the distance between the main mirror, the back primary mirror, and the secondary, which again is just kind of hidden behind here. Yeah, well, with the hyperbolic mirrors, the alignment is also critical. So, do you, we won't spend too much time on this, but if you want to give us a brief, uh... yeah. So this is this is the same sort of process, and you can use that same visual uh, way of collimating. In actual fact, it's um, it's, you know, it's good to be able to do that. But um, using this collimation tool, and if anybody's interested afterwards, I'll show you how to do it. If anybody's got an RC and doesn't know how to do it, I'm happy to take this one out of collimation and bring it back into collimation. Um, so basically what this tool does um, is it's just a, it is really just a, a telescope, it's got a dot marked in the center of it, and it's got a little screen on there which you can see if I just put my finger on it, it just illuminates a, a screen on, on the inside of that. And all you're doing is you're looking into the telescope and you're looking at the secondary mirror and the reflection from the primary mirror of what's out in the room. You can do this during, during the day. Um, so you look at the, se the secondary on these is center spotted, there's a, there's a dot in the middle of them. So what you do is you align that center spot with the dot that you can see in there if you look through this when it's in there. So if you're interested, you can have a look afterwards. You align the secondary by looking at that, you get in that center spot in the center of here. And then the primary, um, these have got a bit of a quirk. Uh, on, these are arguably built a bit too good for um, how the internet says you use this, or the manual you get with this is how you use it. Because there's a baffle in here, which is basically just a tube which stops straight light coming from the outside and going down into the eyepiece. 
and the baffle on these is just slightly too long, so you can't see any light at all that comes around the edge of, of this secondary baffle here. And that's really important because what you look for when you're collimating these is that the image, um, the way I do this anyway, is that the image coming in, you can see these spiders, and then on the, they get, the image of the spiders gets reflected in the two mirrors and you can see that through the scope. So you line up the two sets of images of the spiders. When they're lined up and the secondary's lined up, it's collimated. Um, or at least as good as the starting point as you need to be able to do a couple of final tweaks with it. So I'm not going to labor on that. It's a little bit hard to visualize. It took me ages even having this and that in my house to visualize how it's worked. But I can demonstrate. Uh, but you do have to do some scary stuff, which is reach in here and pull off that baffle, unscrew it, and leave it set inside your telescope because it won't come out because it's too big to fit through here without knocking it and scratching your secondary or your primary. And if you just spent $1,975 on one of those, you probably don't want to scratch it. So, so one question is why, why would you get one of those? And the reason is that it's the way the mirrors are designed is that you have a really good um, low aberrations right out to a big field, which means they're great for astrophotography, so you're not going to get optical aberrations out in the edge of the field. So they're probably more aimed at uh, astrophotography than visual observing. Pretty much every professional telescope these days is a rich impression design. So um, the ones you see on the hilltops and um, in South America and South Africa, the ones you see floating around in space. The like Hubble Space Telescope uh, are all rich impression designs. So they're kind of like primaries and secondaries. But as Bill said, a lot of those um, aberrations you get, like coma, uh, don't it, you don't get that at all in this design. The only thing that you do get, and it does um, affect some people particularly, depends how big your camera is to the size of your telescope, is the image is, is flat, but it's also curved. So you might get the images, if you've got a full frame camera or an 8 inch or a 10 inch scope, you might see that the very edges of your image are a little bit soft. They'll be perfectly flat, but they'll be soft because they'll be slightly out of focus because the imaging plane is curved. There's always a compromise, there are no telescope designs that aren't a compromise. Um, I'll just mention one other type of scope which is coming actually back into fashion for larger amateur telescopes is uh, based on the Dawn Kirkham design, one of our members, I think, was it Graham Loftus? Uh, Harry Williams. Oh, it was Harry Williams made a, one of these, I think a 24 inch mirror, which I think he was challenged to make a. It was 24.5. Oh, 24.5, and he yeah. wanted it to be bigger than the Zeiss telescope. Easy, so, he made one, <laughs> <laughs> so the these telescopes are fairly simple because um, you have a spherical secondary, um, which actually makes collimation a lot easier. And um, the other thing, easier to um, manufacture as well. And these were excellent telescopes for planetary viewing. They had really bad off-axis aberrations, but with better optical design, they've come back into fashion a lot because now you can design, you see down near the hole in front of the second, the, sorry, the primary mirror, there's a couple of lenses there, sub aperture corrector, and these give a perfectly flat field. So the fabulous telescopes for astrophotography. Um, generally, I, I don't know that anyone makes them less than sort of like 17 inch diameter. So and I know Plainway made one with a one meter mirror that cost half a million US dollars or something like that. Astros don't sell one, but if you've got half a million dollar budget, come talk to Astros. We will sell one. We'll sell you something. <laughs> But they've actually become quite popular again because they're actually even better than the RC if you've got a, a really large chip on your camera. Um, because one era of the RC still suffers from what's called um, curvature of field. Even though the aberrations are good, you'll have the stars in the corners being slightly out of focus. And you can correct this with a sub aperture corrector, but basically. This is doing that anyway, so... Um, um, Takahashi actually make um, smallish ones, what's it called? The oh, the new line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah we, we had a guy, um, Professor Paul Groot came here as our, um, what was the lecture, the Beatrice Hill Tinsley lecture series he did, and he was getting a whole heap of these um, 
designs made, slightly different, they call it a heart of wind, but it's very similar, whereas Blackbird telescopes, they were putting dozens of them around the world for um, basically they were doing follow-up optical observations for the gravitational wave observatory. So LIGO and Virgo said, hey, there's been a gravitational wave come through, I think it's roughly here. These they could get anywhere in the world which was in the right position, they could slew um, remotely using this kind of telescope. And having a large flat field was important because they don't know exactly where where the event happens. <laughs> Anyway. And if you're in the billion dollar telescope market. Oh, okay. Uh, the Vera so Rubin Observatory. The, or so the, um, so the long ago, it's probably been a talk a number of years ago from the, on the project notice for the uh, European uh, extremely large telescopes. So it's the new 39 meter telescope that's been put in Chile. Yeah, 39 meters is a big idea. It was a 42 meter telescope, uh, but unfortunately, it's not the answer. The um, that mirror system is a five mirror system telescope. So I don't think I'll twist on it to, to correct. Um, get Bryce and Zervich out to their instruments over there. So yeah, they have five mirror system. One of the mirrors is micro thin because it can be busted for a gap of optics. So. Um, Are you selling this? I will sell you mine if you really want to. He'll find a way. If you've got the money, he'll probably um, find something. But yeah, the, the, I guess the surgical mirror on that one is, is so thin that she flicks it live with actuators to correct the atmospheric vibrations. So we've already talked about two different, three different variations of the Cassegrain telescope, the classical one, the Ritchie Creation, the Dual Curtain. So probably, um, yeah, it's probably the most common general telescope design is the, the Cassegrain variations of it. And now we're coming up to the other sort that you may come across. Steve's got his hand on one here. These are called catadioptric telescopes. They're generally um, a basic Cassegrain design where you have a secondary mirror and primary mirror lined up with a hole in the, in the primary. So common ones that you probably will come across is the Schmidt Cassegrain, which is this one, and another one called the Matsutov. We actually have a Matsutov in the storeroom, a 12-inch one. Been looking for a home for it for years. But anyway, we'll just um, quickly look at the Schmidt Cassegrain. And so you can talk about car here, because this is actually quite easy. There's a little Mac, I'm going at a little Mac. So. Oh, okay. So, um, this one, you have a um, secondary mirror which is actually mounted in an optical glass corrector plate at the front of the tube. So um, at the back, um, you've got the main mirror there, a similar arrangement to a normal, uh, a normal cast grain. And the idea, this tries to get images not quite as good, but getting to similar quality to the Richard Tration. And the way it does that is by using this optical corrector. So that's a very subtle shape of that. If you looked at it, you couldn't really tell that it's not flat. But there's a very subtle shape there that makes enough um, deflection of the uh, light coming in the tube to get rid of a lot of the uh, optical aberrations. Um, the standard traditional one still has a bit of off-axis coma, but there are um, improved designs that correct for that a little bit as well, like the research scope and um, that ground runs up here is a one of these so-called cone free of some cast grain. Now these and hyperbolic mirrors, so they're kind of a hybrid between it's sort of a, a, a hybrid between a rich equation and a schmidt cast grain. Yeah. So um, anyway, do you want to tell us about collimating these things? So these are super easy uh, because you've only got three screws to adjust. You do need to use a star or an artificial star. You need to be looking at a point um, source, but really all you've got to do is look at that slightly out of focus image and get it so that the, the dark circle in the middle is right in the middle of the brighter circle around the outside. So there's really all you've got to do, three screws, same as, same as all of these in fact, there's three screws here which will adjust the tilt of that secondary mirror that's in behind there. So again, it's on the plate, pivots on the top, three screws just adjust the position of it. Um, and you do that with a camera or looking through the eyepiece. 
Um, if you look online, there's a whole bunch of guides which will, the usual way of doing this to work out which way you need to adjust it if you're doing this visually by looking through it, is look through and put your hand over part of it, don't touch the, the correct plate of course, and um, see whether your hand is near the bit, you really need to move that central part towards or away from your hand, and then it work out which screw is closest to that. So I put that on that screw and I, know, and I realize that I've got to move it so it's close to my hand, then I'll be adjusting this screw. If I've got to move it that way, then I'll think, oh, well, it's probably that screw I need to adjust. Again, it's the same thing, you tighten one, in order to tighten one screw, you've got to loosen the other two slightly. In order to loosen that one screw, you've got to tighten the other two slightly. Uh, don't over tighten them uh, because it can actually warp the mirror, depending on how the mirror is mounted into the secondary holder. But these are pretty straightforward. And most guides you'll see on Cold Mash will be talking about these because these are the most popular scopes that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, no primary mirror adjustment. In fact, on most um, Schmidt Cassegrain scopes, actually, um, you can't adjust the mirror tilt because the mirror actually moves. So the focuser on Schmidt Cassegrain grains, as opposed to just moving this in and out, actually moves the mirror cell, the, the, the primary mirror in and out. Um, that's not to say it's not possible to focus by having a focuser on the back. Most astrophotography setups that are using a Schmidt Cassegrain will put a motorized focuser on the back here. Now, so usually you lock the mirror yeah. in a position so it doesn't flop around. So, a so lot of scopes, if they're designed for astrophotography, this isn't. This scope is actually really designed for visual. I mean, you can tell because of the mount, it's an Altaz mount. Uh, it's a topic for another talk. Um, but you can see that there's really any to focus on here. If you buy one of these that's designed for astrophotography, there'll often be another adjustment knob, which is a mirror lock. So you put this into the position you want, lock that screw or lock that knob or lock those three screws, and that'll stop the mirror moving at all. Uh, and then if you do fine focusing, you put a motorized focuser and hang that off the back there. The reason they had that mirror lock is I think when they started doing astrophotography with these, this is a really popular design from going back to probably the 1970s. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I had a uh, first uh, test grade uh, in the country, which is a C8. Oh, okay. Well, the, um, at the time, had the return of Hayley's Comet, which was what about 1986? There was a huge rush on these. So if you buy an old um, Celestron or Mead Smith Cassegrain, you don't want, want one that was made around that year because I've heard the quality control really slow because they shipped such a huge number of these. But the old ones are actually really good, the um, Celestron orange tube ones. Uh, the they still that work fine today. And the uh, mirrors are protected in these with the corrector plate on the front means you don't get rubbish getting onto the main mirror, so that's one good advantage of them. Yeah, you do get a couple of disadvantages of them though, is because you have this piece of glass that's really far out on your, your tube, observing these tend to dew up really mm -hmm. quickly, so you're observing and they'll just fog up. So most people are observing with these will either have a dew strap, which is a heater that goes across mm -hmm. to just add a bit of heat to, to that corrector plate that can affect your image depending on how hot you're running it. Or well, the simple one actually is to just have a tube that comes out and uh, yeah. that will... Uh, cardboard is a tube yep. is all right. A piece of cardboard, um, doesn't have to flare out or anything because you're looking at parallel light, so just a piece of foam or a piece of cardboard that comes out to about here and you shouldn't get any during on that. The other thing is, is these do get dirty. If you're using them with people who don't know, you can get fingerprints on them. Uh, you have to be super careful cleaning these. Um, same really with any optical surfaces, and I would typically say if you're thinking of cleaning your mirror on your reflecting telescope, don't, and it probably doesn't need cleaning. But if it really does something bad happen, then come talk to me. Don't clean mirrors in general. Um, but sometimes you will need to clean the corrector plate, and you'll obviously you're going to need to clean your eyepieces and things like that. So being really, really careful because all of these, this optical glass has got a really, really thin coating on there, which is designed to increase the amount of light that gets transmitted through the lens or through the, the surface, the glass surface, and also cut down on stray reflections. Um, if you just get in here with a, you know, a cloth that you might use for your, your glasses that you're wearing or whatever, um, there's a really good chance you're going to put a scratch in that coating, um, which can have a whole bunch of negatives. So if you've got any scratches on here, it can actually refract light, um, which you might not notice from your image directly, but it's going to reduce contrast from what you're looking at. Um, 
you can start to see multiple diffraction spikes. You don't see diffraction spikes actually on one of these because there's no spider. So you won't see that. If you get a bright star where you look through one of these um, scopes, you'll see the kind of spikes that come off it. One of these doesn't have it because there's nothing to diffract. But you might start to see that if you've got a scratch on those coatings. So how do you so how do you so how do I do it? Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a process that I would do. So first of all, I would get, I've got a, um, I forgot to bring it tonight, I've got just from a camera shot, one of those bulb blowers yeah. to blow yeah. it, get any dust off it. Yeah. Um, I use, I typically just use white tissue paper, white yeah. tissues. So you go in the supermarket, the tissues that you might use to blow your nose, but not with any coatings on there. Yeah. Don't get aloe vera coated ones or anything like that. Also, don't get recycled tissues. Recycled tissue is bad because you don't know what's chopped up in there. But generally, the white tissue is there soft enough that they're not going to damage the coating. Um, but you still don't rub. So the way that I do it, I use a super secret mixture that's not secret at all. It was taught to me by Graham Beasley, who was a previous curator of instruments, uh, which is demineralized water. You can buy that from Super Cheap Auto or Repco or one of these places, what you might put in a battery. So it's got no minerals in it at all. It's not just distilled water, although distilled water can be can have no minerals in it, but it's sold as demineralized water. The reason you want that is when it dries, you don't want there to be stuff left over. So water with minerals in will leave it filled. So I use 70% demineralized water, 30% isopropyl alcohol, and just a small amount, I've never measured it, a bit of a half a squirt, maybe quarter of a squirt of um, dishwashing liquid. All of those elements have got the purpose. The dishwasher liquid is going to remove any oil films, um, the isopropyl alcohol. Uh, it helps the water evaporate, and it also has, it's also a solvent. Um, at 30%, it's not going to damage any coatings. If you just spray isopropyl alcohol on 100%, yeah, probably 90% of the time you're going to be fine because that's probably how they're cleaning the factory. But you might not be. Your, your coatings might end up being damaged by really, really harsh alcohol. And you don't necessarily know how pure that that ice prop alcohol is, so always dissolve it down. So I use that, I use it in a spray gun, but I don't spray the telescope. I spray clean tissue, and then what I do is I dab the surface really gently. Turn the tissue over, don't use the same piece again, dab it. What you're trying to do is any dust on there, what you want to do is that you want it to stick to the tissue. So you put that on there, dab it on, pull the tissue off, any dust on there, which is what's going to scratch your surface. Your tissue's not going to scratch your surface, any dust or any contaminants on there. Uh, but do that all the way around, really gently. As you keep going, you'll notice that there's less resistance. You'll notice that it's actually starting to feel smoother. Um, and then it's just a case of keeping going through, trying to get that clean with using as, as light touch as you can. Um, you can also use pure demineralized water to just make sure that that's cleaned up afterwards. That demineralized water should evaporate off without leaving any water spots behind. Um, that's the process. Tissues, lots of tissues. Never reuse a tissue, throw it away afterwards. That's, uh, it's the same with that piece. Effectively patting it, right? Yeah, patting it most of the time. And once you're sure that it's clean and you've got rid of the contaminants, you can probably give it a, just a light sort of, and not kind of radially. Um, just give it a like sort of clean if you see there's some spots. If you've got something that's um, like really tricky, somebody's put their hand right on it, you've got these really horrible fingerprints, or you've got some contaminants like uh, pollen and things like that. Pollen's a real pain. So you get pollen that lands on there and it sort of sticks. Um, you might get um, mold from time to time. You might see mold spots on it. has been kept damp for it's an older scope. Um, you can, it's very un unusual, you have to clean the back of it, but with, with mold, fungus, spores, you might end up having to clean the back of it. What's important if you ever do, if you ever disassemble one of these and take that corrector plate off, that corrector plate has an orientation. So in the factory, they match the orientation to the mirror. So if you ever take it out, mark it where it went. So mark the top with the top of the scope. On the oldest celestrons, I'm not sure of this vintage, certainly the orange tubes, if you look on the edge of the, the corrector plate, and that corrector is a lot thicker than you think it is actually, um, there's actually a, a number etched on it, and that always sits at the top. So what should that mean? Um, no, they're not. Uh, because I used to have an eye on myself. Oh. Back in the 72. Oh, yeah, they, they were really small etched on the side. Mm. Mm -hmm. Any more questions, Alan? The demineralized water. Yeah. Is that, do you make it yourself? Do you, do you pour that? Is, is it out 
that or work through it good enough? Um, probably not. Probably not. So the, for the, the sake of about the, eight dollars. I was just going to say the the um, your um, filtered water can still have dissolved salts in it, yeah. and the problem is when the water evaporates, it'll leave those salts as a film left behind on the on yeah. the optical surface. So distilled water, technically, yeah, possibly. Um, I do actually sometimes have people come into me. This is no word of a lie. I mean, you might be thinking this in the back of your head, but don't do it. Uh, I've had people ask me, can I use the water out of my dehumidifier? Because effectively that is um, distilled water. But of course not. I mean, if you, and you've got to dehumidifier, you empty it, but all that dust comes through into the water. But I've had serious questions, can I just use the water out of my dehumidifier? Because that's pure because it's just come from the air. Um, so you just got to wrap cold or super cheap. You buy it in like five litres for about eight bucks or something. Uh, and it lasts forever because you, you hardly use anything. Obviously, make sure you don't get it contaminated. Um, but it's so cheap, you just not even worry about making it. So what's your the solution? How long will it last for? Can you, can you, can you leave it for a year? Yeah, give it a tight container because the alcohol will potentially evaporate off and you'll not have as much alcohol. Um, isopropyl alcohol, you can buy at any yeah, DIY sure. shop. You can now buy it again. It was all completely unavailable to buy because they really bought it to make hand sanitizer. Yeah. Um, but it's now available back in the shops again. Uh, that's because WHO said you can make your own if you can't buy it in the shops, just go and buy isopropyl alcohol. I wanted to buy some to clean lenses, could I get any? Nah. So you yeah, just buy it. Um, I've seen it in Bunnings, I've seen it in you know, places like J-Car, um, I'm sure in a whole lot of other places, they usually buy it in meter bottles. Yeah, the chemist shop as well. Yeah, chemist also shops, known. yeah, kinda, but the last time I bought it from a chemist shop, they sold me 80 mils and charged me 10 bucks for it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, you can buy it. And they asked me about 400 questions. What are you doing with this? Why do you need it? Oh, we have to ask these questions because uh, people may use it to make drugs. And I'm like, how many drugs am I going to make with 80 mils of isopropyl alcohol? I can go to Bunnings tomorrow and buy a litre for 10 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, DIY shops. Pet shops. Was <laughs> yeah, people, yeah, yeah that, that would have been the right answer. <laughs> Uh, don't use acetone, um, so you know, in the, next to it in the shop you'll have isopropyl alcohol acetone. Acetone is bad, it will melt half of these plastic bits, and it won't be good for your coating. Um, going back to the collimation, um, some of the celestrons, like the edge, have the removable secondary and the adjustable corrective plates. Yep. Um, does that make any difference for collimation when you put the secondary back in? Or You'll need to recollimate it. Yeah, you need to recollimate. So this one's actually got removable sink. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you will have to recollimate it. I'm not sure about the corrector plate. Yeah. Because um, that's such a subtle change, I'm actually not. Yeah, the, the HHDs have got screws on the, the outside yeah. that will actually reposition the, uh, the secondary where the yeah. center will not. Yeah, I'm aware of that, but I have no idea how to do that. But I can't look it up. But he's got an HHD and it's Maybe that's one how to work it out. I'm sure we can. Steve and I will work it out. Okay, no. <laughs> right, um, um, that's probably enough of telescopes. Just wanted to talk about a few accessories. Yeah, you missed the map that you've got on the screen there, though. Sorry? Max. Oh, yeah, yeah, we better, yeah, sorry, we better talk about the first thing you mentioned, Max. Max the top is the other fairly not so common these days, but. Well, it's quite a common amateur scope. Oh, small ones are still common. No, yeah, um, I don't know if you, um, years ago in Scientific American, they used to have these uh, pictures of Questar tabletop telescopes. I don't know if anyone, anyone ever saw those, but they were little uh, three and a half inch um, aperture um, uh, telescope. They did make them up to a seven inch aperture, and they, they were really expensive, but some people had them just as like an ornament. So you'd have, have one sitting on your desk because they were all made out of nicely brushed aluminium and, and uh, really nicely engineered. But um, me had a, it was the ETX model was a yep. Maxitol yep. as well. Oh, they're still selling it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maxitol. Yeah. As well as so what, these, these, were, these are kind of a combination of um, reflective and refractive optics. So the um, corrector plate in this case, so it was a large meniscus lens. And the secondary mirror is just a spot. So you had a silver spot on the back of the uh, meniscus lens 
So there's no um, collimation of the secondary mirror. <laughs> so you no, you do have primary collimation. Yes, yeah, so that's an entry, quite an interesting design. And amateurs <coughs> in the past actually made these because all the surfaces are spherical. But um, the design is such that it's fairly, um, um, not totally free of aberration, but really gives really nice images. So um, that was the last. I'll just quickly go through a few things about eyepieces, as we're running out of time. Cleaning, the maintenance of these is the same as for the corrector plates, clean the um, optical surfaces. Hopefully the inside one won't get too grubby because it's not being exposed to you putting your eye out to it and you should always cap it when you're not using it. Pro tip, if you do ever have to clean that and you have this bright idea that I'm just going to pull it apart because I can work out how it comes apart, to record how it went together because there's a few separate lenses in there and the order and the orientation really does matter. So I do from time to time end up with people turning up at my house with a little box that jingles and says, I pulled this apart and I'm not sure how to put it back together and I can't make it work. So yes, it is possible to open them up and it is possible to clean all the surfaces separately and sometimes you, you kind of got to do that. So if you had somebody who's kind of you know, dropped it on the floor and it's kind of got gunk on the inside of it, maybe you've got to do that. I try and avoid it. Even the most basic pieces will have three or four lenses in them. Yeah, this one is a, is a GSO Super View, which is five or six. Yeah, okay. This is actually a fairly um, reasonable price and gives quite nice images, I found. Um, I think these come with the uh, Dobsonian okay. Astron cell. Um, and you notice that it's, uh, for some weird reason, and we still measure the barrel size in Imperial, so that's a two inch eyepiece. But the focal length is measured in millimetres. <laughs> so there's a combination of metric and imperial. So that's a 30mm one, which would be considered a wide angle eyepiece. So um, the way um, that you work it out is if you want to know how much magnification you're getting, you take your focal length of your telescope, for example, the 8 inch top side in there, I think is 1.2 metres. So with one of these. It is. Sorry? It's Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, it's um, 200 mils across. That's right. So times six, so it's 1200 millimeter focal yeah. length. So if you're using one of these, the magnification is just 30 divided into 1200. So that's 40 times. So um, you tend to, if you want to go to a shorter mode focal length, and some people get a bit confused, they see these bigger lenses think, oh, yeah, that must be higher power, but it's actually the opposite. The um, short focal length lenses give you the higher power. And usually the shorter focal length ones come in a one and a quarter inch diameter. Um, for example, this one here, and that's another one that came with this type of telescope. Is um, a slightly simpler design than that one is called a, a, a plossel or a super plossel and this particular one is 9 millimetres. So with these plossel eyepieces what I found is they give quite nice views but the field of view that it looks like you can see is narrower than the, the super view one, it's a different optical design and as you get to shorter focal lengths you have to get your eye closer and closer to the lens. Um, that's called eye relief, so whereas that lens you could use with eyeglasses quite comfortably, this one, it won't work because you, you can't get close enough to the lens. And that the hole you're looking through is correspondingly smaller too, so you have to get eye in the right place. Yeah. And you've got, and you've got kids or what observe telescopes with kids, they really struggle to get their eyes in the right place anyway. So you've got a high magnification lens on them and they struggle even more. So what I do, is instead of using one of those, if you've got the public involved, use one of these combined with one of these. This is um, what's called a Barlow lens, which is a negative lens, effectively increases the focal length of your telescope. 
They're usually designed for a particular magnification. This is a two times one. Although you can fiddle with the magnification depending on where you position it, but the trouble is that you're using it outside of its design. Um, so you, you combine the two together, you get double the magnification, but doesn't change the eye relief, so it's much more comfortable to use. Obviously, you've got more optical elements, so maybe it degrades the view a little bit, but particularly for public sessions, I, I always do that, especially if we're showing planets, because you need a bit more magnification, but it's a lot easier for people to look through this combination than the short focal length lens. So, oh, I, I, that's the combination I use mostly with my, I've got one of those eight inch ones and my most common pairing is, is these two together. I have got um, another lens which is a lot more expensive, as I, um, gives similar magnification to that combo, a little bit more magnification, but it's um, a more advanced design so it gives you a much wider field of view, apparent field, but um, um, I thought that lens of Andrew convinced me to buy it. But it gives really nice views, but it does um, cost quite a bit more. And then you can go to um, extremes, or even more than extremes. So you saw the diamond lens that. Um, so just one. Yeah. How's that for a long piece? <laughs> so that one is actually very close to the same focal length as this one. So I this, you had the 9 mil one with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, th this is a 28 mil one. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have got a, um, a shorter focal length of this similar design. So, um, you'd think, well, why the heck would you do that? Well, the difference is this actually belongs to the society. It gives you a 82 degree field of view. So, at the same magnification, this is, I think, um, what are they, about 65 degrees, Andrew? Super view. Okay, so just for that bit of extra field of view, you're paying a lot more. So this is almost as much as the price of the telescope because there's probably what 10 or 11 optical elements in this thing. Yes, there's eight, eight, is it? Okay. So, but if you feel like it's, the the one waves over a kilo, those right hand waves over a kilo, or one kilo. Because of that focus telescope, it's lovely views, but. Yeah. I, I know some of you are photographers, so you'll know that just because you've got a 70mm lens, it doesn't mean the same. So a 70mm um, Canon L series lens with uh, really expensive glass is going to give you a completely different view than whatever kit lens you've got that might be the same focal length. So, um, so the design all... of the lens really matters, and the more glass and the more exotic the glass, the more expensive. Yeah, so this will have less chromatic aberration than this one. And probably more, more optical correction out to the edge of the field and that's why they can open the field stop up so you can see a much bigger area of the sky at the same magnification because the optical design is a lot more complicated to get rid of the aberrations that would be in the outer field of this one if they let you see that far out. But it's also Oh yeah, that, okay. This is this is not really anything to do with the lens itself. It's to do yeah. with the ways where your eyes work. Um, your eyes have got an area in the um, centre which is packed with colour-sensitive cells called um, cones, mm -hmm. and that works really well in daytime, and you have the best. Um, resolution or visual acuity in that central part of the, the um, view. But as you move to the outer part of your eye, there's less of these cones and more of another kind of cell in your eye called rods. And they, they are basically work much better in low light conditions. And so they don't work very well in bright light at all. They use a pigment called visual purple, which gets destroyed by really bright light. But at night, they come into their own and you'll notice that you start when the, those rod cells start taking over you start to lose your colour vision when the light is really dim but 
that's what you want to use with a telescope because when you're looking at faint galaxies and nebula, they can be seen more easily by the rod cells than the cone cells. So they call it averted vision. You, you see where the galaxy is and instead of aiming your vision to focus directly on it, you look slightly off to the side and that means that the image of the galaxy is forming onto the, the rods rather than the cones. You will have experienced this and not realised that often as, this, as, often as it's going dark at night and you, you become aware of the first stars coming out, you look straight at them and it, I'm sure I saw a star there before, yeah, but it's right. gone. Yeah. Um, but the stars are there, but it's just that the rods on the, on the side of your vision pick that up because they're way more sensitive um, to, to changes in brightness. Uh, and your cones are just less sensitive to the really sort of well contrast dim light. So you, you will see that every every time. You, and I'm sure you've all experienced that. You look up at the sky, I'm sure there was a star there, and you look forward again, and you can see it, it's there, but you can only see it out of the, the sort of corner of your eye. Exactly the same. You look through the eyepiece, you've got a galaxy in the middle, don't even try to look at it. Now, it's hard to train yourself to do that because the, the vision, and you, you're just looking, you know, look forward right now, and what, what you can see when you're not looking at something, it's not quite as sharp, there's not quite as many cells there, but you can see more. So try it next time at the telescope, don't look at the thing you're looking at, just look off to the side of it. Not with planets, of course, because they're really bright, so um, um, you can look straight at those. But um, yeah, it's quite, uh, the technique, if I didn't mention it, is called averted vision. Yeah, yeah like if you look at like a globular cluster as well, yep. you know, don't look straight at it because you're not, you're not going to see it. You, you kind of just look out the corner of your eye, type of thing. Yep. Yeah. It just, it just pops out. Yeah, it just yeah. takes a bit of practice to learn how to do that. And it's really strange. It's hard to teach yourself because you want to look at it because you want to get that extra detail in it, but you've not got the ability. Your eye can't really see it because it's too faint. So you've got to train yourself to understand what that detail is out of your peripheral vision. And just, just hold it there for, for a, a good 30 seconds yep. to a minute because people go, go look and oh, I can't see anything and they walk away and then they look, just hold it, hold it and ah, yep. you know. And as Bill said, um, the, your, when you get your night vision, that's not just you becoming used to the light, there's actually a chemical change that's going on in your eye. It's actually, actually a chemical change. So that chemical change gets destroyed as soon as there's a bright light. The pigments actually change chemically. So if somebody's, you're observing and then somebody drives the car into the driveway <laughs> to get the bright lights, um, or, or Gavin's still there, Gavin decides he's leaving Waharao and going to his uh, hotel room at 11 o'clock and turns his car off. Um, it's gonna take you half an hour, 40 minutes to get that level of night vision back. And there's no way of doing that. So often you'll see people close one eye Keep one eye closed if you kind of have to put your torch on and do something. Um, it's actually, the, it's actually uh, theorized that's why pirates were an eye patch. Not because they've lost their eye in a battle, but because as a pirate you're going to go and plunder a ship, you're going to come from the bright sunlit um, deck and you're going to go down into the deck and in, into under the decks and fight people. You've got this eye patch keeping your night vision going on that eye. You get under the deck, lift your eye patch up, suddenly you can see. Now I actually, in my astronomy kit, I've got some kids' eye patches for that exact reason. So you're a pirate, right? Yeah. I've certainly stepped them next to my telescope at night and put my eye patch on. Because sometimes you've got to go in the house, right? You've got to go, oh my god, I forgot the whatever by my desk. So I'll flick the eye patch down on the house. My wife is crazy. Say something, if you have to walk around, get a red light torch. You can buy them from Super Bowl for $50. Because red lights don't, you can see, you won't be falling over things. And you don't lose your dark yeah, red light is good for maintaining that. Not perfect. Actually, it's a dark amber light, which is best, but a red light is Yeah, is well, easy. that's what we require if you've got any torches to walk around. No white torches are allowed, and if you leave, no headlights you use back to light. So you park at a distance and you don't see people. But if you're walking around, you need a red light. Any supermarket or something. Yeah, the bright green lights. So, yeah. we've, we've gone a lot longer than I thought, but there was just two quick things to talk about. If you want to use a camera with your telescope, quite often um, if you've got a, a, like a DSLR or a new mirrorless camera that are coming out these days with an interchangeable lens, you can connect that kind of camera to your telescope. And the way you do it is with one of these adapters, it's called a T-ring adapter. And this one is for Canon, uh, Canon EF mount. So 
that will you can take the lens off your camera. Um, I think the T stands for Tamron, isn't it? Because they, I think Tamron and yeah, these or yeah, something. So. There's T and there's T2. There's no difference between T and T2. They're exactly the same. The T2 yeah. just means that it's usually got a little uh, grub screw, which means you can pivot it rather than put it in a different position. Yeah, um, basically you, ha you have to get one for your camera, like Canon, Nikon, and all the other brands. They all have their own mounting system, so you have to get one for your camera. And then and what you need is one so of the... That's why that mystery one there is if you can tell me what camera it would fit, I'd be impressed with it. It would light up the slate of the battery. Oh, okay. Okay, so basically what you do then, you have this here, which just um, screws in, and that, that's for connecting to a two inch focuser. You can get ones that step down for a, a one and a quarter inch focuser as well, if you have one of those. And so you can um, connect your camera up for prime focus. And Steve just got one other little thing to show you. Um, for people that um, like to take pictures with cell phones, you can actually use the eyepiece, a um, medical eyepiece projection with a cell phone, but it's quite hard to position it correctly. So there's these little gadgets that allow you to put... So for the, the moon, or for, um, well, mainly the moon, um, arguably you could take photos of bright planets, but they're a bit heavy. Um, but for lunar photography, actually you get as good, if not better, photos from most cell phones as you will from a dedicated astronomy camera. The moon is bright. It's the same brightness as a sunlit beach in the daytime. So if you're, if you're into photography, that's the settings that you would use. So a, a smartphone camera works perfectly. But the hard thing is, as we talked about that exit pupil, getting your eye in just the right place for the, for the eyepiece, that's kind of even harder when you're trying to hold your camera up to the, to the eyepiece. This eyepiece is probably too big for this. It's uh, too much, too chunky on Let's go with a, a more realistic size one. Um, so this has just got a, an a, adjustable clamp. You can adjust it so that your phone camera is exactly in the right place. Just by loosening that off, get your camera in the right place. And then the advantage is you can just take it on and off and it keeps your camera in the right place. So if you want to take photos of the moon, set your cell phone up, throw it on, take some photos, take some video, and people will be impressed by your uh, lunar photography. So, um, Andrew can sort you out with, uh, with these if you want one of those. Mm. Oh, one other, sorry, there is just one last thing I was going to talk about earlier to do with photography with a, um, with a Dobsonian that really normally designed for visual use and you'll find if you put a camera on there like a DSLR you won't be able to get it to focus. You've basically got two options. You can actually, the problem is you can't get in close enough to get the, the image to form on the uh, chip inside the camera. Possibly with the new mirrorless cameras, you might, you because might there's it. less of a, a gap in the front of the camera. But uh, for DSLR, what some people do, if they really want to use a Newtonian for astrophotography, you actually move the mirror further up the tube, so that pushes the focal plane far enough out. Trouble is, that's not so great for visual observing. There but, are some Newtonians, as possible, have the Skywatcher ones that are made yeah, with it, flash, yeah, that's right. Like most of the ones that are only for And, and, and the they can be really great for astrophotography. photography. The fast ones are typically kind of that. Yeah. yeah. Rolf Olsen, I know some of you may have heard of, is, this is really amazing astrophotography. He uses a Newtonian, but it's, he built it himself, but it's got the mirrors set up with, for astrophotography, not for uh, visual observing. But, but he also uses a coma corrector. Yeah, which, uh, which fixes the aberrations. And that's the other problem with Newtonian, is that the other part of the field you'll have coma. So for photography, you really notice that. So you can use a coma corrector as well, which is another lens. Hey, I've got a camera, DSLR, prime focus on a Skywatcher, one of those LTS with mounts, Dobsonian mounts, and they're really good for astrophotography. Yeah. And you know, no trouble focusing it, and that was with a F6 8-inch um, tracking dog. It just depends on the camera and the accommodation, the, and the telescope accommodation. 
Yes. So some yeah. cameras will focus um, the, the DSLRs won't, but they have plenty of It depends how well. far back the sensor and the, the actual optical, well, the, 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 the sensor or chip on the camera is back from the front of the camera. It also depends on your um, your adjustment of your mirror for collimation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you basically, the way that that works is it's on some screws. So if you loosen all of those screws and tighten all of the push screws, you're actually moving the mirror further in. Um, so you can, if you're not quite getting the focus, but almost, you can actually just adjust your collimation, mm -hmm. push your mirror up. You okay. might get to the end of your, your adjustment, mm -hmm. but that is possible. Or another trick you can do is this is the Barlow lens, which I've taken to bits. If you just use that, that will um, that part you screw into here and um, use that with your camera. So camera on that end, that will actually achieve focus because of that, the Barlow actually moves the focal position out and it also um, doubles the magnification. So if you're doing planetary imaging, that could be a useful mm -hmm. or lunar imaging maybe, you could do that trick. Um, that we were just saying about moving the mirror, adjusting collimation and moving the mirror does move the mirror up and down the tube. That doesn't matter on most, and as I said, this, this type of scope here, it's schmeck cassegrain, that's how you focus, you move the mirror up and down. If you've got uh, RC, a rich equation, that's really problematic, because we said that, that spacing between the mirrors is really, really critical. Um, I'll not show you now, but if you're interested, come and have a look. Um, this scope is a little piece of tape over one of those collimation screws to make sure that I never adjust all three screws to, to move the mirror to it, closer to or further away in the second view. So, most scopes doesn't matter, these ones it really doesn't matter. Okay, I think we've done. Are there any final questions? Have you got a question yeah. here? Um, what's the, what filter would you recommend for looking at Mars visually? Oh, right, because um, planets are very bright in the eyepiece. Yeah. So you want to remove the glare, probably. Um, um, what would anyone, got any ideas on that? Or you could try a neutral density filter. Um, or maybe something that blocks out. You yeah. probably don't want to block the red out completely. <laughs> no, you probably, I mean, something like a neutral density filter is going to take some of that glare away. Um, exactly what I meant, I don't know. Probably the astrophotographers are going to have a better idea than that. Although with astrophotography, you just expose for that yeah. time, so it's, uh, it's probably not. Yeah, I know perhaps some people, have, but it's coming quite popular with some people to actually draw at the eyepiece, like Andy Cho and um, there's another guy um, Yeah, we're seeing another uh, Another yeah. guy started doing it as well and does really amazing drawings of what they see in the eyepiece and for that you might want to take a bit of the glare away so yeah, some kind of uh, maybe a neutral density filter especially for looking at the moon because the moon is really dazzling in a telescope Okay, any final questions? You're welcome to come up and ask questions afterwards. I'm going to hang around and have a poke and prod up some of the gear. Righty, thanks, thanks for coming.